Okay, I think we have like a couple of things on the uh, agenda. So um, I think the first one was uh, around this uh, to kind of give a quick update of, of on where we are, and then um, and then uh, like we have a follow up um, uh, discussions on the uh, archiving uh, work that uh, Garen has been working on. Maybe I can start with. Yeah, Phil, given that this is like a, a quick thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, so like we have, uh, we started to kind of um, go back to the that fee cap that uh, I, I was looking at the draft. It was first put together end of June last year. So it has been sitting, accumulating dust for a long time. And um, yeah, so we're, we're actually like looking into this again. Um, we started, uh, uh, by doing a couple things. So, first one was around um, refreshing the the cap to reflect as much as possible where we left it, where we left uh, things off in the on the dev ma mailing list. Uh, there's plenty of still of open questions, and uh, yeah, we're going to go over that. Um, I think the other thing was that we yeah, started a, a thread. Uh, on, on Discord, on the, on the dev uh, channels. So, yeah, at this point, it's more like, uh, yeah, we need to go through and iterate on this uh, before we can give uh, more updates on, uh, on what's going to be next on the on the fee front. And basically, like, the, yeah, what we're realizing is that there are a lot of things that we didn't incorporate yet, like the, you know, this was written before we had, for example, the pre-flight in the picture, uh, things like that. So, yeah, there will be uh, for sure a little more, uh, a few more changes that need to uh, need to be done. Um, but that's kind of uh, where we are with this. Uh, I don't know if we want to kind of spend more time uh, on this. Just like uh, you know, I'm inviting people to uh, to kind of follow the, the conversations and uh, yeah and. Talk about and prop maybe help on uh, you know helping us making decisions on this one. Do we maybe want to give a very high level overview of what is there and uh, you know what are the open questions we are trying to solve? Or recently, should spend more time on the archival uh, proposal. Yeah, I think that yeah, like so. I guess yeah, good good point. Uh, like the type of things we are trying to uh, big issues, I would say that we need to uh, to kind of converge on uh, on the fee front is on what type of um, experience we want to expose to uh, contract developers when it comes to um, the different markets that uh, that that exist in the system. So we have the uh, different resource types. We have uh, um, ledger space. We have uh, compute. So like uh, when when transactions execute, uh, we have uh, network bandwidth, and then we have uh, I think in terms of fee markets, that's kind of it. We have other fees that are related more to external systems. So like when people, uh, for example. Uh, Produce uh, metadata that then then gets uh, consumed by uh, systems like uh, Horizon or Solvan RPC or yeah like uh, Stellar Expert even right like uses uh, this kind of uh, of uh, data stream so like making it that people can just uh, spam those other systems is is part of the you know in scope for for the the fee schedule. Um, and then what did I forget? Oh yeah, um, we have also archives. Uh, what has basically ends up uh, mandatory, right? Like published to those uh, history archives. Uh, so making sure also that people don't use that as an alternative to S3 or you know like other places that you know where people can store data if they want want to. But the difference here is that those history archives are. Um, are meant to kind of exist forever after, so uh, there are some constraints there. Um, and yeah, so like the type of, of problems around those, um, this, um, the, the, the model for fees is 
how do we make it that we can balance usability? So right now, you know, people used to, to the classic system. They have a very simple way to think about fees. Basically, you have a base fee for one operation. If your transaction contains more than one, you just multiply, and that's kind of your your base in a way to kind of think think about the you know in terms of fee. And then if you want to get ahead of, of other transactions on the network for whatever reason, uh, you just increase your your fee, and that's kind of it, right? Um, and in Soravan, like the because of the competition between those different um, resource types that are open-ended, uh, right, in terms of um, consumption and competition. So, um, yeah, we're going to need something a little bit better than that. Uh, I mean, like they're, 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 they're like uh, in places like in you know, Ethereum, they have uh, uh, you know a version of what you can do do with fees. So this is a single fee um, for for everything. Um, there are like proposals to make it maybe as pay when it comes to um, uh, to different um, resource types, uh, but that's not implemented yet in Ethereum. Uh, it is implemented in other on, on places like Polkadot, I think. Um, but yeah, that's why we are kind of trying to get something usable. Okay, uh, I think that's kind of what I wanted to talk about on the fee front. Just, you know, heads up, <laughs> it's coming. Um, let's see. And uh, yeah, we have the next uh, Garen that I think wanted to give us uh, a little more updates on. Last time there was like, a, we started to talk about the archive. Um, uh, mechanism that allows to to save space on the on the ledger, so that we can keep the network uh, um, as cheap as as possible. Uh, and uh, I think there were a, a few interesting con uh, follow up conversations that also happen uh, after that uh, in Discord and off Discord. So, Aaron, can you give us maybe a a little uh, a few updates on what's going on there? Yeah, so I guess first I want to talk a little or just have some time for questions about the uh, interface that we talked about last week. And so kind of just like a high level summary of what we went over uh, last time is essentially all Soroban uh, data has this rent fee and this rent balance. Um, and so every ledger or uh, periodically you have to pay rent for keeping an entry live on the ledger. And then whenever an entry runs out of uh, its rent balance, it gets deleted from the ledger and then sent to the archive. And so with that interface, uh, we've kind of exposed three different classes of storage. Uh, these kind of three different types of storage replace uh, today what is currently um, the storage layer, which is like env.storage uh, in your smart contract code. And so what these three types of storage are is we have a unique storage, which is there's only ever one version of the entry that exists. Uh, the entry either exists on the bucket list or there's a single version of that entry on the archive, but never both. And this is useful for uh, types of data that have security concerns, such as nonces or certain types of authorization, where there could be security risks and issues if you have multiple versions of that entry uh, that could be restored. Kind of the, uh, the use case here is if you could think about um, implementing a nonce where you didn't have this unique storage guarantee, you could uh, find yourself where you have a uh, version one of the nonce in the archive with like say value five and then version two of the nonce in the archive with a different value and then you can imagine how a malicious user could restore those entries in such a way that your nonce value is out of date and not the correct value that it should be so that's unique data it's more expensive because you have to prove that something doesn't exist in the archive whenever you create something new and so there's a little bit of work that needs to be done so it's the most expensive data type um, but it's reserved for like those security um, and high risk sort of uh, entries. Uh, and then after unique storage, we have what's called recreatable storage, which is a similar in that recreatable storage entries, whenever you uh, run out of rent balance, also get sent to the archive. The only difference is that recreatable storage might have different versions um, in the archive or multiple different versions exist at the same time. The reason for this is that whenever you create a recreatable storage entry, you don't check the archive to see if something already exists there. 
And so say you have something like a balance that got archived, and then you go to create a new version of that after uh, your old key got archived. In recreatable storage, you don't check the archive, and so you just create a new entry with the exact same key. And so you have this key collision. Um, and so that's uh, it's a little cheaper than unique storage because you don't have to check the archive and actually show that this entry is unique. There could be multiple versions of it. Uh, so it's cheaper, but it's not appropriate for security types such as like nonces or auth, uh, where you don't want multiple versions. And so that's unique storage and uh, recreatable storage, both of which can be archived. And then the final type of storage is called temporary storage. And this are for short-lived entries. And so whenever a temporary storage entry runs out of rent, it just gets deleted. It doesn't get sent to the archive. And so temporary storage isn't appropriate for sensitive data that you want to keep around, like user balances, uh, but it can be useful for data types that either don't need to live very often, like a short-term authorization to let an address spend your funds, for instance, or for data types that can be easily recreated if they get deleted, such as like a, a payment path or a payment channel or something like that. And so I think um, now, if anyone, I think first I just want to open up the floor for questions and to talk about this kind of like a interface and in particular talk about this like three-tiered approach and having three different uh, classes of storage. Because I know that there was a little controversial and it's um, definitely a little bit more complex than the current interface. So I was wondering if there are any questions um, there. Uh, I do. I do have a question if, if I can. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, uh, this is in 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 my sense, this is actually a, a, a very good design. I, I like it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm wondering, in terms of staging uh, this work, I, I it's quite complicated uh, and and involved, and, and some some quantity of it is going to depend on um, some pretty big components being built out in terms of the archivers, um, which is fine. And and I think we can I think we can do some staging. Um, I'm I'm in the sense of of you know deploying versions of of Zorobon that uh, have the interface, but but you know some of it is just defined to do nothing at this point or that sort of thing. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the unique storage one because unique uh, right off the bat has to have these these uh, exclusion proofs in order to do any writes. Is that correct? Yeah, so I think what we could do is we can still do a staging process, right? Um, and so I think what this would probably look like in practice is whenever we launch Sorbonne, we don't have the archive built out. And mm -hmm. so kind of uh, the current plan for you know, V0 on launch is to have the interface set, so to expose the unique, recreable, and temporary storage entry types to the user, and then to charge rent. Um, and so uh, the, the, the thing that won't be there, though, is that whenever your rent balance goes to zero, you won't get deleted and you won't get sent to the archive. Uh, because the archive won't be built yet, right? And yeah, so but... I think for unique data in particular, what we probably just want to do is we can still, I think, we still should launch uh, unique data and recreatable storage um, just so that contracts can have the correct paradigm written at launch. But what we can do, I think, at the implementation level is just before, uh, just special case it, right? So like before we have these proofs, we can just say um, essentially like creating unique entries does not require proof of exclusion until we actually provide an interface for those proof of exclusions. That's, that's, that's exactly the part I was, I was asking about is, is, do you think we would just sort of make it an optional field at first? And then when we rev the protocol, the optional field has to have a value in it and we'll define what that value is in the future. Well, we could do that. Or actually, now that I'm thinking about it, um, what we could do is just, uh, zero initialize the root hash and say the root archive hash is null. And then um, proofs of exclusion become trivial, right? Because if your hash is null, uh, then you're guaranteed that it's empty. And so I actually think we can provide proofs of exclusion on day zero, actually, um, if we just define the, the null hash. And so the proof will always be null, but that's yeah. a valid proof if your root hash is null. OK. The other thing I'm thinking is um, that you want, this, you want to use uniques for nonces and uh, it seems like we we update nonces quite a lot, um, and so I'm I'm a little bit concerned about sort of an, an expensive operation that involves constructing a a proof of exclusion has to adhere to every every nonce update. Certainly, 
I, I wonder about the nonces that are maintained by the auth system. Maybe Dima could speak to that. I think that there yeah, is. Yeah, I a... can answer if you don't mind, yeah. Garen. So I, I think Garen is using nonce example is well just uh, an example of uh, why this problem matters. For the built in nonces, at least, uh, we decided to move forward with a temporary nonce approach where nonces and signatures basically have some time boundaries and uh, stored in the temporary ledger entries. So they don't even run okay, into they're, they're this not, issue not, okay. over title. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, okay. I, I would say this should be a preferred approach, right? Like I reiterated this uh, several times uh, in the discussions here on Discord that um, with the existence of temporary storage, it's a really good idea to try benefit from it and uh, uh, try to design for it, right? Like in this case of nonsense, right? We can have this 100%. approach yeah, yeah. where we need to bump it multiple times and it's not super convenient and stuff. And uh, I think the main use case for the unique storage is really some admin data. Like you really don't want your uh, admin entry to be taken over by someone just because it has expired, right? You have a token contract that you have initialed once a year ago and you have never touched it, but you don't want like after a year, the rent has expired. You don't really want someone else to just reinitialize it because the entry has expired. So I feel like this is the main use case and these are really pretty cold entries if you think about it, right? So yeah. yeah I, and thinking, thinking about this a bit, I, I, I... I sort of retract my concern because I, I think you're right that if 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 the system has a well-defined notion of temporary storage with with time limits on it, then you just you just time bound anything that is that is you 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 propagate those time bounds to the things that use that storage such that they they would they would become invalid at, at the same moment. So I, I I can see that being quite quite a viable approach. I like that. That's good. Thank you. I also uh, want to uh, make one additional clarification. I think in your original question, you said, oh, do you have to like provide proof of exclusion every time you update it? And that's not true. Uh, you only have to provide the proof at creation time. Um, and then, of course, you have to provide proofs if you run out of rent and then it gets sent to the archive. Uh, but once it's actually live on the bucket list, then um, it's as, just as if you're modifying any other entry. Uh, the proofs only apply if it's not on the bucket list or if you're creating something for the first time. And so if it's like, um, again, this is just an example, but like if it's a nonce that's regularly used, uh, then it wouldn't matter. It'd be very cheap and, and efficient because it would never go to the archive. Okay. And oh, I have, I have one other very minor question. Uh, and this is more of a, a design, <laughs> like time to hit the thesaurus. Uh, we already have something in a system called an archive. Uh, I, I, I just feel like we got to use a different word for this because it's just going to it's just gonna foul up a, a, a lot of things that already refer to archive. Okay. Yeah, maybe like deep state source and like that, but yeah, I don't, I don't know what you call it, but well, maybe, maybe not start with deep state. That might be a tough <laughs> graveyard. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. So I guess um, any other questions about specifically the uh, recreatable temporary and then unique storage interface before we move on? Uh, yes, I'd like to ask um, uh, why. Um... Like, is there any reason uh, why you don't uh, use uh, something like a Bloom filter uh, to um, to check uh, whether uh, the entry already exists uh, in the archive or no? Uh, because uh, given uh, given the notion that we have a Bloom filter of uh, all entries uh, in the archive, uh, we can probably. Uh, avoid uh, having uh, multiple versions uh, of uh, archived entries. Uh, and uh, I think uh, having only one version in the archive uh, and uh, preventing uh, users to recreate uh, some entries that already exist in the archive uh, makes uh, a lot of things uh, easier. Yeah, so we definitely investigate this um, a lot. And we tried to find a way, if there was a way for validators to store keys or to at least have some knowledge of what's in the archive. I think there's a couple issues there. So first, um, the goal of the archival state is to bound the amount of storage that validators need to store. And so if they need to store a key, even though that's you know less than storing the entire uh, data entry, that's still an unbounded storage. So that's issue number one. But I think in particular, um, you'd have to have a set of keys that grows unbounded. And that's not a great solution because especially for Sorbonne um, data types, uh, there's a lot of instances where the key is actually as big or larger than the value. Because if you can think like uh, the keys are 32 bytes, um, and I'm not you know super in depth at the current Sorbonne implementation, so correct me if I'm wrong, 
my understanding is keys are 32 bytes, uh, but the value, um, for instance, could be something as small as like an int that's only like four bytes or something like that. And so I think um, you're not getting as good of cost savings as you think if you just store the keys in a set. Now to your bloom filter question, or if there's a way to store the keys in um, a more efficient manner, the issue with bloom filters in particular is that they don't, it's very difficult to resize the bloom filter. And so if you say, I have unbound state um, and say, okay, we're going to pick a bloom filter that's one gigabyte large, um, but in 10 years, you need a larger bloom filter because you're getting a lot of collisions and stuff. It's impossible to just resize that bloom filter uh, without having all the values. Because whenever you change the size of the bloom filter, you have to rehash everything that you've added to the bloom filter, which would not be possible for the validators because they've thrown all those values away. And so you'd essentially, to resize your bloom filter, have to replay history from the beginning of time in order to uh, resurface all the values that need to be in that bloom filter. Uh, and additionally, there's still issues with bloom filters because they're probabilistic in nature. And so you would still have key collisions sometimes, or I guess, um, or, or not key collisions rather, um, because they only return, um, they don't return false negatives, I don't think. But then um, there'd be certain keys that just based on the probabilistic nature of the bloom filter, uh, the uh, validators would think they were in the archive, even though they weren't in the archive. And so that would also be an issue where um, just based on whatever your hash function is, there'd be certain keys that would essentially be impossible to create because the bloom filter thinks they already exist when they really don't. Um, so if that answers your question about the uh, the bloom filter issue in particular and the, the issue in general as well. Um, I'm not entirely uh, sure that um, the resizing uh, issue is uh, such a huge problem because uh, you have an archive uh, where you have all the keys. Uh, so once uh, in a let's say 10 years, uh, it's possible to organize uh, a resizing um, using uh, the archives uh, as a source of all the existing keys uh, and to make like a maintenance uh, for all the validators. Uh, as for the size of the Bloom filter, for example, uh, I just checked and uh, 1 billion entries uh, uh, with a reasonable um, uh, false positives, uh, like uh, point, uh, uh, 0.1 percent uh, uh, probability of uh, false negatives uh, takes about uh, two and a half uh, gigabytes. Uh, so it's not that large and uh, it will be enough uh, for the first billion entries uh, I think uh, it's a reasonable uh, trade-off uh, to avoid uh, some other complexities. As for the um, false positives case, uh, I think um, since you have uh, the vertical tree uh, or some other structure, if it's uh, not set in stone yet, uh, then you can probably check uh, whether uh, the archive, whether the archive uh, contains uh, the given key, uh, give given key if it's, uh, let's say, can be resurrected or something like this. Maybe I'm missing something because I haven't think about this uh, for quite a long time. Uh, but uh, do you still think that uh, using some bloom filters other probabilistic structures uh, won't uh, help uh, to prevent uh, collisions uh, of uh, entries in archives. Like maybe there is some other option. Because yeah. uh, this uh, point looks uh, like one of the most uh, controversial uh, things about the archives to me. Yeah, this is a, an interesting idea, actually. I think um, you mentioned that perhaps use the bloom filter um, as like a, a almost a caching layer for efficiency and then um, using the proofs as kind of like a backend in case you get a false positive. But I'm still not 100% sure if the false positive case can be avoided, right? Because say like a, from a, this would be very frustrating from a user standpoint, say I have a key um, or like there's some like deterministic way of like defining keys, right? So like I give my address um, and then like that address is input that generates um, the keys uh, for entries associated with my account, right? like in a token contract. If one of those keys is a false positive, 
then you just won't be able to create any entries uh, based on your uh, your the uh, invoker address, right? And so I don't know if there's a way, if you get a false positive, to somehow check the archive and say, oh, actually, that wasn't a false positive. It really is. Uh, it really doesn't exist, I promise. Um, and so I'm not sure if there is a way to get around that case, because I think, like, even if you say, like, a reasonable false positive rate, like a 0.1%, that still means that one out of, I think, a thousand keys, um, or maybe a ten thousand keys, I might be off by zero or something there. But essentially, like one in a thousand keys, um, you'll think it's in the archive when it really isn't, which means that you are not allowed to create one of a thousand, one out of a thousand keys, which I feel like could be a really significant issue from a user interface perspective. Do you think uh, that uh, the time uh, of uh, checking um, the existence of the key uh, over the Merkle tree or the Merkle tree or, or the structure uh, you plan to use for uh, uh, archive proofs, uh, it's like um, a really huge uh, time, like it's, uh, seconds, minutes, uh, or even more. Uh, because uh, if uh, it's relatively small, uh, then um, checking uh, checking the existence uh, only for conflicting entries, and uh, you will be uh, checking conflicting entries only when someone tries uh, to create already existing uh, entry, which uh, actually shouldn't be uh, as uh, uh as uh, often uh, operation uh, so uh, like uh, what are the time uh, requirements uh, for checking against uh, the try well so i think uh one uh, point of clarification here is that you can't just check against the archive directly because the archivers don't participate in consensus and are not validators uh they are off chain right and so you can't just like uh, search through the tree brute force and trust that the contents are correct. So there has to be some way for the um, archivers to give a proof to validators that the validators can then um, validate themselves. And so I think that's why part of the reason we're using this try model, uh, where we can get both proofs of exclusion and proofs of inclusion. Because I think um, the difference between um, this case and the Ubuntu case is that in the Ubuntu case, you can trust the, uh, the archive. In our case, we can't trust the archive. We have to have some proof via like a hash or something. And so I'm still, I think, I think it could be interesting, this Bloom filter approach, if we can do the Bloom filter, um, and then if there's a collision, maybe um, say, even though there's a collision in the Bloom filter, I'm going to go and get a proof of exclusion. Um, and that would perhaps make it more efficient um, and mean that in most cases, you can get away with creating entries without a proof of exclusion. Um, but I'm still not sure what that would look like. I guess maybe what we could do is you create your entry, you check the bloom filter, um, and then if you get an error on the bloom filter, then you go try to get a proof of exclusion. And if there's a valid proof of exclusion on chain, that can overwrite the bloom filter. That might be an interesting optimization. Um, but I guess the second point. No, yes, so, um, so, so for, uh, for explanation, I don't want to steal uh, the time. Uh, it's definitely um, like uh, I, I need to make more research on this, and uh, probably we should uh, get back on this in the same matter to don't steal the time uh, uh, on this question here. <laughs> Thanks for the explanation, Grant. I yeah, I think that's a, I think it's definitely an interesting idea. That's definitely worth pursuing. Um, but I guess one question I would ask is under this proposal of the Bloom filter and whatnot, this would make all data unique data. And so I'm wondering if there are use cases where a user might actually want data to be recreatable. Uh, so thinking in the balance use case, I'm thinking like, is there ever a scenario where it's actually an advantage to have multiple different versions, um, as opposed to only having this strict um, one uh, unique key um, per archive per bucket list. So I'm thinking like, uh, for instance, in the case of balances where the multiple different versions of the balance can just be summed together. Is that a advantage? Um, and is there like a, do we still want to expose a recreatable storage interface 
so you can be even faster and I guess like a, not have to do this like bloom filter check, not have to do this proof of exclusion, all that sort of stuff. Or is like a strict guarantee, one key, no collisions, um, powerful, and that we shouldn't expose this interface at all. Mm, to tell the truth, from uh, my experience, uh, there is uh, probably no mm -hmm. cases when you need uh, several versions uh, of the same ledger entry. In most cases, uh, it's uh, even uh, a destructive uh, problem, right? Because uh, creating an account or something else uh, may uh, may be a huge problem. Uh, I, I'd say that uh, the uh, use case for uh, like optional recreating uh, or man maintaining uh, several versions of the same uh, ledger entry is uh, rather uh, rather rare, and uh, I haven't uh, seen any use cases for this. I just want to add to that that basically from the contract to host interface standpoint, like there is no versioning. I mean, we will add it to kind of work around some issues in the current approach. But in general, the interface is that like you put something into storage and it will stay there, quote unquote, forever. Or, you know, if you put it into temp storage, then it will. Uh, Will be removed after a certain time period, but you no, know, like even from the purely the interface standpoint, there is like no case for this multiple entry versions, and uh, I think the main reason we are thinking of adding it is just to kind of save uh, some time and cost, just to be able to quickly create entries without proof of proof of exclusion. But it's more like an implementation detail that. Unfortunately, the contract writers would need to worry about in some cases versus like, you know, something that is a thing that can be used uh, as a feature for the contract logic, right? Like if you would need any sort of versioning, you can build it yourself using just various keys or whatnot. So I'm pretty sure there is no legitimate case for recreatable storage beyond like or uh, requirements uh, to the scalability. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, like maybe I can add uh, that the, the reason, the, right now, the, the reason we are looking at this recruitable storage is that we have token balances that are interestingly uh, one of the kind of uh, primary uh, use cases for, for Stellar, right? And uh, if we don't have recreatable uh, storage, we basically would have either temporaries, right, uh, entries which for balance is a no-go, or going with those uh, unique uh, entries, and for that uh, you need proofs uh, to create a balance. Uh, so the cost of um, an overhead of uh, just kind of setting up your wallet becomes uh, uh, you know, quite uh, quite big for any new token. That's kind of the the problem here. Is that um, I think the overhead of of uh, proofs is probably acceptable the first time you kind of create your own wallet on your on the network, but any time you add uh, a balance for uh, any token, uh, it seems that uh, having this overhead is kind of too much. Um, but yeah, maybe we. That's kind of part of this discussion, right? To see, you know, are we wrong here? Yeah. So I guess the the trade off then with the bloom filter approach, where um, you know, and let's just put aside like the uh, resizing and migration issues for now. But with the bloom filter approach, all data is unique. Um, but the false positive uh, rate is the percentage of the time that you will need to provide a proof of exclusion for creating a new entry. And so that's just, I guess, the trade off is. Everything is unique and the interface is easier, but one out of a thousand creations are very slow and require proofs of, create, uh, proofs of exclusion. Whereas if we have unique data and recreatable data, then the unique data is guaranteed to always be slow, but the recreatable data is guaranteed to always be fast. And so I guess the trade-off is, do we want um, 
all data to be fast most of the time, uh, or all data creation to be fast most of the time, and sometimes to be really slow for the easier user interface, or have a more complex user interface where one type of data is always slow to create, and one type of data is guaranteed always fast to create. I guess that's the, uh, the fundamental trade-off, at least in my mind. And that sounds about right. Like the, the thing about the blue filter, though, is that if in the context of like a balance, right, the ID, the, the key, right, of that balance is actually deterministic. So as it's deterministic, it becomes kind of um, attackable uh, unless we can come up with like a cryptographic, uh, you know, bloom filter of sorts. Uh, it's it's very easy to basically, pre, uh, you know, cause certain keys to be um, to have conflicts in the bloom filter, and then you're kind of back to, like, you know, even though it's one in a thousand, you know, if you're the one that is always hit by the by the one, uh, it kind of sucks. Uh, what if uh, we utilize uh, B3 index uh, or some other index uh, like uh, database uh, actually doing this? Uh, and uh, besides that, uh, the index itself uh, can reside uh, on the disk uh, and uh, uh, the fast cache can be implemented uh, using the bloom filter and uh, the actual check uh, will be carried uh, over the index for example b3 index uh, the I mean, way, for the example, issue... database uh, handles this i mean the issue with an index is we're getting to that issue where if we have any deterministic index like that we need to store the keys right um and then we have that same issue of unbounded state growth and especially with store on data where the keys can sometimes be significantly larger to the value. So I think any like deterministic data structure, we kind of get back into that issue of we have unbounded state, which defeats the purpose of the archive in the first place. Yeah, I, I just want to remind like basically these two need to maintain consensus and we, we cannot just like randomly update boom filter, for example, right? It has to be a part of consensus. So we would need to come up with some way to hash it quickly and uh, add it to the CP values and uh, make sure it's archived properly, you know, with a significant amount of work. And uh, I mean, you could say that uh, the keys are stored in the ledger forever, and then you build some sort of index on them or kind of off chain, but then you know, yeah, it kind of no longer fulfills the requirement of having limited ledger state rows which we wanted to fulfill so it's kind of an issue and uh, yeah that for that source like it was my first idea as well like what if we just throw keys in the ledger but yeah that unfortunately kind of doesn't scale as well yeah so i think i think the um bloom filter with a proof of exclusion fallback for false positives is an interesting idea um but i think we probably have some technical homework to do there um, so I think if it's all right for everyone to move on to the second um, topic. I'm not hearing any objections, so I'll take that as a yes. So kind of stepping away from the um, user interface, now talking about how the uh, archiver interface will be set up. And so uh, currently, um, there are kind of like two proposals. Um, one where we have an archive interface that functions similar to kind of how Horizon functions now where you go to a specific archiver, uh, you have some URL endpoint, and then you uh, query that endpoint with the keys you want to be archived. Um, and so this is like a, a model similar to what we have today with Horizon. Um, some of the pros, there's pros and cons. Uh, one of the cons is that you have to have like a personal relationship or at least know an archiver to go to. Um, and then it's not super clear how we could incentivize or monetize uh, this sort of interface uh, Perhaps you'd have to like pay a monthly subscription to the archiver. Perhaps you'd have some uh, relationship where you like pay your archiver per entry lookup or something like that. Um, but it's not super clear how we incentivize uh, people to actually run archivers in the setup. So the second scenario is where we have kind of um, what I'm referring to as the archive miners, uh, kind of stealing the um, minor terminology from Bitcoin. Um, so essentially how this would work is instead of querying an archiver directly, whenever you need a proof, you submit a proof request 
um, on chain. Uh, now this could either be implemented at the protocol level where a proof request is an operation, or this might also be able to be implemented by like a, a first party smart contract. Uh, but that's not really important right now. But essentially you would just submit an operation that requests an archival proof. And then um, by submitting this operation, you'd submit meta information that archivers could then ingest. Uh, and that's how the archivers would know about the requests. And as part of this um, operation, you would say the key you want to be proven, uh, the type of proof, so like proof of inclusion, proof of exclusion, and then also a reward. Uh, and this reward would be variable, and you would be uh, the uh, would be at the user's discretion as to what to set this reward to. And then this um, operation, this request would go on chain, and the, the meta would be uh, submitted. And so an archiver would then ingest this meta, and then pick what um, requests they want to service. And so they could service the request that has the highest reward first. Um, and then they construct the proof with the information that they store. And then they submit the proof in another operation. And then the proof itself uh, becomes an entry on the ledger. And so once that proof has been submitted and validated and the proof is on ledger, then the proof or the um, proof request is deleted and the reward is given to whoever submitted the uh, correct archival proof first. And so this is, um, I think, a better interface because it has a clearly defined incentive structure and also doesn't require any personal relationships with an archiver. And so you don't have to have a URL that you talk to or you don't have to have a relationship with some company that you pay monthly or pay some subscription fee in order to access the archive. It also allows archivers to freely um, enter and exit the network as they please and also by having a variable reward um, that the user can set you can also have essentially like a built-in supply and demand dynamics where that price fluctuates over time depending on how many um, people want to restore archived entries and how many archivers want to service archives and so i guess uh, generally speaking what are our thoughts on the two approaches um, and kind of the leading approach being this um, submitting uh, proof request to the chain and then having archivers uh, read the chain and then um, submit the proofs. Uh, how do we feel about that? My dear speak. Um, let's see. So like the, the thing I'm, I'm thinking of, right, in terms of like uh, minimal viable product, I'm thinking the having a way to talk directly to archives is is kind of uh, uh, foolproof. Um, the uh, the approach where you use the on chain state, um, uh, I think. I mean, it's. I think there is like good potential there. I think it, it's uh, it's going to be fairly tricky to get this right. Uh, the reason being that basically, uh, you so you have. Um, you're not creating like intrinsic value, right, to certain transactions uh, that are being published on the overlay, and therefore a um, like a, a bot of sorts, right, can can look at this overlay traffic and front run, take the data, right, that is the pre image, right, the proof, and front run the uh, the archiver that actually did the work and benefit from the archiver. So I think there is like an interesting problem there to solve in terms of like, how can you safely uh, uh, disclose the, uh, the proof to the network without uh, being front run? Well, you have to sign it, right? Just need some entities that can be signing it, verifying it. Well, the issue though with signing is how can like a uh, like the mempool not just like take your proof and then sign with its own address and then submit um, as if it was the originator. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think there might be ways to do it, right? Like it's a, it's a, uh, 
maybe what you 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 it's like a multiple multi-step thing right where you you because you were first to disclose let's say the hash of the proof before you actually disclose the proof then you're the one you know if it's a contract that's doing the that work um then you can basically give the uh, the first uh, you know first one the, the benefit i mean at the same time like a yeah, maybe a bot can. I mean, it becomes kind of a, a, a cat and a, a, you know a mouse uh, game, right? Like where you you, you have yeah, to I th how to do this safely. Yeah, I think and the front running. Like, like because you know you also have like to penalize people that maybe are not. Uh, I mean, are trying to game the system. Yeah, I I thought like the uh, the front running um, idea was just to like uh, if they're the same proofs, multiple of the same proofs in the same block, just to arbitrarily or randomly pick one. But I didn't think about this proof stealing case um, and front running by stealing proof. So this is definitely an interesting issue to think about. But I still I still like the model where you don't have to have a relationship with the archiver for a couple of reasons. So first, um, it's likely that especially you know um, if the archive system is run for a long time. Archivers will not store the entire archive. I, uh, I think it's a good idea to let the archive pick and choose how much or how little of history or of the archive history they want to store. And so I can see an archiver uh, that only stores the last five years, one that stores the last ten years, and then one that's like a more expensive one that stores like the last fifty years, for instance. And I think if you have to like individually query an archiver, you have this weird interface where for things that are three years old, you can maybe query the cheap archiver. And then for things that are older, you have to change your URL or something like that uh, to target like a different archive that has more history state or something like that. And so I think there's still some some interface issues with uh, having to talk to the archiver directly. Uh, but at least off the top of my head, I don't have a great solution to this stealing proofs thing. Um, and I think that's the yeah, challenge. Is yeah. If you have a... I, I think, yeah, I was going to say like the... the uh, I think it's it's a... We should definitely be looking into those um, mechanisms that are like a little more distributed, right? And from a you know, discovery point of view, um, I think all it means is that we use uh, we we have the proper semantics on network uh, to allow for for doing this. So, like I, I think, for example, like the thing where we have uh, proofs that are usable. Independently of uh, using, uh, you know, uh, the entries, um, yeah, I think this is like a, a, a key uh, property that we need to have, right? Because uh, I, I know, like, one of the uh, earlier drafts uh, was requiring people to submit proofs in the same transaction uh, that they were going to use the, you know, the actual and actually restore the entry. And obviously, this uh, this would not work, in, you know, would not enable this type of uh, of, uh, of scenarios. Yeah, I definitely like having having the um, let, or the proofs themselves be ledger entries. I just I think we just need to find the uh, the best way to to make sure the system isn't ganged or gamed. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's a because there's not a clear solution because I mean you could submit say like before you submit the proof you submit the hash to say hey I was here first. And then submit the proof on the next ledger, but then you could open yourself up to DOS attacks where a malicious user could just generate a bunch of dummy proofs and then submit them for every archive request, and then archivers would not uh, want to service those requests because someone's already spoken for it, and issues like that. So, so I think we need to think about. But I definitely like. I think we definitely should have uh, the proofs on chain, like you mentioned, um, and and we should see if there's a way to solve this issue in a, a way that makes sense. Let's see, we have uh, you know, a few more minutes left. Uh, was there like some other topic that you wanted to cover as part of, of this? Yeah, so I guess one other question that's kind of that we don't have a great solution for, um, and this is one that we need to figure out here pretty soon because it's required at launch for V0, is how to bump rent. And so right now, uh, whenever you create an entry, um, it's created and initialized its rent balance to some amount, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a great way in order to bump rent and to actually increase that rent balance. And so kind of the initial thought was, hey, whenever you access something, increase the rent. 
Um, and that's the way that the things that are accessed most commonly automatically have their rent increased. And so if you access something a lot, it will most likely be on the bucket list and you won't have to unarchive it. Now for read-write items, this is easy because you have to rewrite the entry anyway, so you might as well bump the rent. However, uh, it's not clear how to bump rent on read-only items. So for instance, if you have auth, um, say like an auth record that's almost never changed but is read often, um, you would want to bump the rent on reads so that you wouldn't have to constantly unarchive it. The issue is, uh, because the way the bucket list is structured, there's no way to bump rent without rewriting the entry. Uh, because, um, essentially, the way the bucket list is structured, entries and buckets are immutable. And so in order to update an entry, it's not like SQL, you can just go to the entry and then change a the value. You have to completely rewrite the entry. And so we wouldn't want to bump rent on every read because then we're implicitly at the systems level, turning reads into read writes, um, which we don't want to do. And so I guess um, in the read write case, we obviously want to bump rent. But I was wondering if there are any ideas as to what to do for like read only data um, and how to handle rent in that regard. Well, uh, simple way I've been thinking about is. Well, well it, it is a bit annoying, but you know, you can expose just some contract function that does read write access to the entries that you want to bump and nothing else. Um, that will basically, well, you, you know, to call just as any other contract function to bump the rent. Um, but that maybe can be generalized to, you know, host functions that allows you touch an arbitrary entries without accessing them so that you know you don't need to uh, um, maintain any invariance in terms of like only the contract can modify its own data uh, i guess we can all agree that bump in the rent is always positive right so anyone can do that and then you know you just have a host function that takes a bunch of ledger keys attaches them at read write uh, allows you bump in the rent by whatever mechanism we come up with um, which again is not super pretty, but that makes it possible to do the bump without patching the contract code and increasing size, size and so on. So, you know, it's a basically generic way to maintain your contracts. I think it's maybe viable. Yeah, I think the host function could be good. I think the only issue with that is key discovery is still an issue. Um, and then it might be difficult to determine what keys you need to bump rent for uh, in the host function. Um, but perhaps yes. one another thing is we could expose a explicit uh, rent bump um, at, at like uh, the storage interface, um, and then also make the current rent balance uh, readable in the smart contract. So I could imagine something like. A, Maybe a common paradigm for read-only data would be like if you have an auth entry, whenever you read it, you say you also have an, a check to see if the rent balance has fallen below some level. And if so, then you call rent bump on that value. Uh, so I guess, or I don't know if that would be possible then because, or no, no, that would be possible. And so then essentially, um, there's a cheap path and an expensive path. And so if your rent is above the value, then preflight would put that entry in the read-only data set. But if your rent is below a value, then preflight would put it in the read write set and bump the rent. And so I think that might be also another possible solution for for auth and like read only data. I mean that's kind of possible, but doesn't solve it for everything. Like imagine again your token, right, and it has uh, you know an admin, and uh, let's say you don't mean this token much, um, so you don't touch the admin entry frequently, and then it would. To expire, right? You, you know, don't well, think... the admin functions frequently enough. So, you know, for the important things, you still need some sort of manual tracking, and you still need to understand which entries need to be updated. I'm sure we can avoid this fool just because you know some entries may be rarely accessible. Well, I think that's okay actually, um, because if you don't access admin very much, and um, whenever you access it, you need to restore your admin entry. I think that's okay. 
I think the case well, I'm talking about is if you have some read-only value that you access a ton that still gets archived all the time. Yeah, but, but my point is that, you know, you can still forget to call it. Uh, so, I mean, relying on automatic bumps is not going to always work. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is that imagine, you know, Oh, maybe that's not a super good example, but I, I've been just thinking about who, who pays for the bump, right? It's always a source account who pays for the bumps. And uh, it would be a bit weird, like if every once in a while, like some transaction to a contract suddenly becomes more expensive because you need to bump the rent, but you may be bumping the rent of some entries that has nothing to do with your account specifically. Like, for example, let's say you have some account that stores some, uh, sorry, some contract that stores some state, say, um, I don't know, token identifiers. Let's say you have a liquidity pool, right? And, uh, it stores its uh, token pair, it's like never going to change, right? And it's always read only. And then there is no clear owner of the token pair, right? They're not um, owned by any address or anything. So what would happen is like every once in a while, someone who trades with this liquidity pool will need to pay for the rent bump of the token pair record. Um, it's just a little bit awkward, right? Because I, I just want to trade why would it charge me more? And you know, I, then there are all the incentives to kind of try to gain this and try to not submit transactions until someone else has bumped. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's definitely viable on paper, but it just leads to these weird situations where, you know, you're kind of bumping rent on some entries that you wouldn't want to know about, right? I guess it also depends on the amount because if it's low enough, yeah. then it probably doesn't matter. But if it's high enough, then suddenly it becomes pretty annoying for the user who ended up paying it. Uh, 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 yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I agree. Like it, we probably need to think about those couple of angles, like the people that want to kind of uh, maintain their their uh, run balance on on those like read only type of items. Uh, that and when I say people here, it could be a contract that tries to do that, like like an AMM, right? That wants to kind of ensure that it keeps alive its own thing. At the same time, there are probably scenarios where you want to kind of uh, do that from the outside uh, in some way, right? Uh, because you don't want every contract. I mean, you, yeah, in the cases where this is going to not work, like if nobody's using it or and you need to revive it or I don't know. Um, anyways, we have time, so thank you everybody. Let's uh, continue those conversations. I, I, actually, we should probably create um, like explicit threads on the uh, you know on the dev channel. Uh, about those topics, and then uh, yeah, we'll keep going. Thank you again.